So uh, today's lecture builds upon yesterday's. And uh, so the first few slides, I'll just remind you about the notation and the terminology. And then we'll get into today's topic. So I uh, started by de uh, describing machine learning as a new kind of science. And uh, uh, as you probably all know, these new break breakthroughs in the last eight, nine years have come out of something called deep learning, which we'll talk about more today. And uh, I'll remind you about uh, what machine learning does. And I phrased machine learning as the problem of finding a suitable function or model given examples of desired input-output behavior. And this model has some tunable knobs or parameters, which we denote by theta. And uh, for many of these applications, it doesn't really matter what's inside this model. And that's the way I described it last time. But today, we'll open it up a little bit and look at deep learning. So yeah, so this uh, model has the desired input-output behavior. X should map to Y. And you're given these examples of X and Y. And uh, for example, X could be an image, uh, a pixel vector. And Y is a desired label, like is it a dog or a cat? And uh, the model, uh, using its internal parameters and the input X, outputs some number F sub theta of X. And uh, for example, in a linear model, it could be just the inner product of theta and X. Theta is a vector, and uh, theta uh, inner product with X is a scalar. So, for, so that's a simple example, but, then, uh, but there can be more complicated models. Now, uh, and then still continuing my recap, uh, uh, machine learning works by uh, using training data, so xi, yi pairs. And uh, the loss is how well does the output of the model, f sub theta of x, uh, uh, describe y, the desired output. And uh, the simplest loss function is the uh, squared loss function, the uh, expected uh, squared loss error. Uh, but uh, you could use other losses. And the uh, formal framework, so how does m uh, learning work? So there is uh, a, a part of fitting the model to the training data, and then a part of testing. And uh, formally, it's described as follows. The, the reason all of this works is that there's an underlying distribution from which all uh, x, y pairs are drawn. The ones used for training and the ones used for testing. So they're all coming from a fixed distribution, uh, which is a very big assumption uh, in this field. And, um, and then, uh, although, I mean, as you can imagine, there's all kinds of um, research to, uh, to go beyond this assumption as well which I won't talk about today. So training uh, is uh, done by just optimizing the loss L of theta, uh, which describes the fit of the model. And uh, at the end of training, you have some uh, value for theta, which is your trained model. And then testing is to take some held out x and y pairs and see how well on these new x, y pairs, which you've never seen before, the output on x matches y. And in practice, say you might have a protocol like you train on 80% of the data and test on 20%. Now, the point is that since the data that you're testing on was not seen before while training, it's expected that this is just a random sample of data that you will see from now on. And, since you're, and if you do well on that, that means that you'll do well on other data that you'll see at deployment time. So all of that can be made precise uh, and, and rigorous. OK, so uh, and the last thing, the last bit of recap is this training algorithm, gradient descent, um, which is the meta algorithm used in, learn, in training these models, uh, which, as the name suggests, is just that you start with some initial value of theta, often random, and you always make a small movement along the direction of negative of the gradient which is the direction of maximum decrease locally. And uh, eta is called the learning rate. And uh, the, uh, the surprising part about this use of gradient descent is that it's used in a non-convex setting, uh, which I illustrate with this figure that convex, as the name suggests, is something like this. And non-convex could have ups and downs. 
And so you'd imagine that gradient descent doesn't work for non-convex. And in a strict sense, it doesn't. I mean, there are obviously starting points where you would get stuck in very bad places. But somehow, uh, in real life, uh, deep net training or uh, machine learning in, in general, uh, it seems to do pretty well. And explaining that is one of the problems we'll see. And uh, in practice, gradient descent can be improved by uh, various tricks, so time-varying ADA. Uh, so the most common thing is that you start with a certain ADA, and then um, you reduce it over time. So, uh, um, so that's, there's some theoretical justification for that in the convex setting, but again, for non-convex setting, not so much, or less, much less so. Um, there's a method called momentum, where you keep track of not just the current gradient, but past gradients, which is something that will make a brief appearance today. Uh, and there's something called regularization, which is the idea that uh, you may not actually want to minimize the loss function. That the global optimal of the loss function is maybe actually not what you want. And so you want actually uh, a, a, a kind of solution which has some other properties, and you add a regularizer a separate term to the loss function uh, to ensure that, which I won't talk about too much today, but uh, may allude to at some point. And so uh, the case we're interested in today for the rest of the talk is deep learning, uh, which refers to models that are multilayered. That's what deep refers to. Uh, and the simplest form of deep learning, which is enough for today's talk, uh, is this form, which I mentioned last time, which is it's a, uh, each layer consists of applying a matrix, so a linear transformation, followed by a very simple nonlinearity, which you can think of as just zeroing out the negative coordinates. Now, in practice, there's something called the ReLU gate, which is slightly more complicated than nonlinearity, which is you don't zero out the negative coordinates, but you decide on a threshold, and then you zero out all the coordinates below that. Okay, so that's the nonlinearity people use. And, um, uh, and you apply this lin linear operation, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, non -linear, et cetera, some number of layers. And uh, how many layers do you need? How many nodes do you need in each layer? Those are all uh, design choices. And there's really no good theory for that currently. Uh, people are trying to re develop such theory. And in practice, those are called hyperparameters. And in general, in deep learning, there are all these hyperparameters, these choices that you have to make before you start training. And there's no good theory for it. And people do some variant of uh, random search to decide those parameters. But there are also some a little bit more principled methods in the last few years. OK. So that's deep learning. And uh, how do you compute the loss, gradient of the loss? You, you would use chain rule, because really the function uh, defined by this network is a composition of functions, right? The, first, the second layer applied on top of the first layer, third layer applied on the second layer, et cetera. So it's a composition of functions. And so you would uh, want to compute the gradient uh, by the chain rule, which is, which is what you can do. And if I were to just tell you to write down the update rule uh, using chain rule, you would write something, but it would probably be not as efficient as it could be. And the back propagation algorithm does it in a more efficient way. OK, a very nice algorithm, one of the great algorithms of the previous century. Um, all right. Now, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, this paradigm uh, has, uh, has acquired a name, which is the end-to-end -end differentiable paradigm. So in this case, of course, yes, there's one model. And so you are computing the gradient by just doing an end-to-end -end differentiation. By the way, this function is not completely differentiable because this nonlinearity is piecewise linear. So there are places where it's not differentiable at that precise point. But at least in every neighborhood, it is differentiable. So um, yeah, so, uh, so this, uh, uh, this, you know, the, 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 the gradient clearly plays a big role. And uh, the way to think about gradient uh, for many people is that it's some kind of a feedback rule, right? So the output was not correct, 
and the gradient is giving you feedback through the network how to change the network so that it better fits the desired output. Now, uh, the end-to-end -end differentiable paradigm is that you could have multiple modules uh, in your task. And like if you do something complicated like uh, language translation or, or self-driving cars, you have, there are many modules. Uh, and the way you want to train them, I mean, you can train them individually, whatever, you can tune them a bit. But ultimately, finally, before production, you want to train them end-to-end -end and propagate the gradient from module to module. So the interface of the modules also needs to be differentiable. Okay, that's like a new paradigm that's become very popular. So yeah, deep learning is not just this, but also these, these days, these modules strung together with possibly different architectures, uh, and it's all end-to-end -end differentiable. Okay. So just a brief history. Um, where this all come from, it came out of thinking about uh, what's going on in here, in the human brain. And in the 1940s, people had some early discoveries about the structure of neurons. And uh, uh, this uh, classic uh, work of McCullough and Pitts at MIT uh, led to these uh, uh, simple neural nets, which were ba where the individual units were thresholded logic units. And so the, the simple uh, threshold I, I showed you where you just zero out the negative coordinates is a very simple uh, example of that. Uh, then there were a few decades of neural nets research. And it's probably fair to say that people were interested in neural nets as a way of also understanding human brains. And, and at that time, there weren't, I mean, there were applications. Uh, people were destroying them. But uh, that was also a big motivation to just understand human brain. And then Minsky and Papert uh, showed that one-layer neural nets, which were very popular in those days, actually have some very uh, have limitations. They can't express a lot of things. And then that actually led to a, uh, a, a great reduction in interest in neural nets. Uh, and then it revived again over the years. And there were, there were phases where there were ups and downs in this field. Uh, and uh, the basic ideas were in place in the 1980s, but somehow the breakthroughs happened only in the last five, six years. OK, so some questions about deep learning. So optimization, when and how can gradient descent find decent solutions? Uh, over parameterization and something related to it called generalization. The number of parameters is way more than the number of training examples. And that, in classical statistics, is a recipe for overfitting. So your model fits to the training data, but it doesn't generalize to, to new data. And uh, so why don't the, these nets generalize uh, very well? Role of depth. Uh, clearly, if you increase the depth of a network, uh, you know, because you can make the new layers all identity, for instance, uh, it can do anything that a, lower, a, a network with fewer layers could do. So it's clearly. In terms of expressing things, it, uh, you know, if you add more layers, you can't hurt. Uh, but you may hurt in other ways, for instance, optimization. And somehow, uh, higher depth seems to help. And now there are techniques to actually increase the depth to hundreds or even thousands of layers, uh, which has been very surprising to most people. Um, then there's uh, something called unsupervised learning, which I briefly described last time, uh, learning from data which has not been labeled by humans. So I give the example of language models. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some approaches to unsupervised learning called generative adversarial nets. So yeah, that's, and then the simpler methods to replace deep learning. Actually, in today's talk, I won't talk about that much. Uh, I should say that this list was taken from a longer talk I have that I gave at ICML this summer. This is a machine learning conference. And those longer, that longer talk is available from my website. So part one, overparameterization and or overprovisioning. That you give the network more resources than it possibly needs or seems to need, and somehow that helps. So it, uh, yeah, you can train networks with tens of millions of parameters using 50,000 examples. Uh, 
So there's uh, evidence that, uh, that I alluded to that over-provisioning the network can help the optimization. So here's a folklore experiment that I call it folklore because I think many people knew about it, but I read about it in a paper from 2014 by Liv So it's a very simple experiment involving a teacher and a, uh, and a trainee network. So there's a network sitting on your computer or in your lab, which has two layers. And uh, you, you came up with this yourself, let's say, with random uh, weights on the edges or something. Okay, so the entries or the matrices in these layers are random, let's say. Or it doesn't matter. Two layer net. And now you generate data using it. Okay, it's sitting there. You can just feed in data, whatever vectors you want, and you get output. So you get a huge number of labeled data, data points, right? You can get a billion examples in a second. So you get a huge number of examples. And now you want to train another net. Okay, so of course you know you generated, you, this net was sitting in your computer, you generated the examples from it, you know that it can be, let's say there are, this network has size 1,000, you know that there is a network of size 1,000 that fits this data, right? Because you generated the data yourself. So now you try to learn the network with 1,000 nodes that describes this data. Okay? You generate it with a network with 1,000 nodes in the middle layer, you know that they, it exists, but now you're trying to find it. See if you can find it by back propagation gradient descent. And that turns out to be difficult. Okay, that, that computation doesn't converge very well. But, uh, and, and you know, you can use, you can, uh, you can, you have a lot of training data, so it's not a problem with not enough training data. So if you have the same number of hidden nodes, 1,000 to 1,000, it's hard. But if you allow more, say 5,000 nodes, it becomes much easier. Okay, so that's uh, what's going on. Okay, good. Uh, I have to be close to this. Um, much easier to train a network with a bigger hidden layer. Now, uh, uh, I've mentioned this to uh, several years, uh, grad students for several years. I've had some very sharp students who've done all kinds of amazing things, but we still don't have any theorem. Nobody has any theorem explaining this. It seems like there should be a, a I mean, it's true, so you should be able to prove it, yeah. Does it, not converge it converges fast. Huh? Converge yes, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it seems, I mean, you can, you can uh, assume whatever, right, that the network had random weights or whatever. I mean, it's completely nice mathematically, right, this setup. And you sh it, it feels like there should be a theorem you can prove, but not being able to. Okay, so uh, there's another r uh, recent paper where we tried to understand why increasing the depth also can help the optimization up to a certain extent. So, um, so the paper makes a more general point, but let me tell you the very simple version. Take the simplest machine learning problem, which is linear regression. Okay, that was this, uh, the, the, the uh, model I started with last time, the linear model. Except we're going to use an L4 loss. Okay, so the, uh, the thing that, uh, the phenomenon I'm describing doesn't happen with L2 loss. Okay, so you have data points x, and the model is theta, the output is x, inner product of x and theta, but the loss is not going to be L2, the square, the sum of squares, but it's sum of fourth powers. So, uh, so that's uh, a classic problem. It's convex. Okay, so sure, everybody knows how to solve this. But we're going to replace it with a depth to linear net. So instead of theta, I'll have beta times theta. So beta is a new parameter, scalar parameter, beta times theta. Why is that a, another layer? Because if the old one was, you know, x goes to x in a product with theta, now there's a new layer beta, which gets multiplied on top, which is really like multiplying by beta times theta. Okay, now you say, wait, yes, it's a two layer net, but it's, you haven't changed the problem, right? Every theta can be thought of as beta times theta, 
and every beta times theta is also a vector. So it's exactly the same problem. So what was the point? And the point is, yes, it is exactly the same problem. But when you train it with gradient descent, the path is very different. OK? So it's not unchanged because the gradient descent path is very different. And in fact, if you do the calculation of what the gradient means, uh, turns out that effectively the new gradient, uh, the new, uh, if you do the gradient on, with this, on this new parameterization with the beta added, you can interpret it as a movement in the original landscape, in the theta landscape, but the path is very different. So it, it's of this type where, yes, you're moving along the current gradient, but also you have some memory of the past gradient. OK, so that's your net movement. Now I mentioned that that's something called, uh, so, so, it's, uh, so, the, so there, there are these different gradients from uh, past time steps as well. And there's some um, coefficient in front of those. So, and those coefficients are varying with time. So it's got these features of these more advanced algorithms that I mentioned, like acceleration uh, or momentum. And indeed, it's kind of like that. But actually, it does better than some of these momentum things. So here's the experimental data, which we found on many data sets, but this is on UCI regression tasks. So there are these standard, uh, some um, so-called acceleration methods like ADA grad and ADA delta, and ours does better than that on this regression task. So this is kind of a striking example of, you know, take the simplest task regression, and you, add, you just add one more layer just with the linearity, and that already changes the gradient in this very surprising way. So in this paper, we talk about more than regression. We talk uh, also about similar effects observed in nonlinear deep nets, although the analysis uh, is much more difficult. I mean, we don't have an analysis for nonlinear deep nets. And then for multilayer linear nets, uh, we have some analysis. And also, we give a proof that this acceleration effect cannot be obtained by any kind of standard manipulation of the original loss function. So there's no, if you just have the original parameterization, there's no function whose gradient is this fancy new gradient. That you can prove by a standard uh, ideas from multivariate calculus. OK, so, so, th so we see that this over-provisioning idea can uh, improve the optimization. Uh, but the textbooks have warned us that large models can overfit. Right? So this is a textbook description of this phenomenon that um, so this is a training error, okay? So as you, and on the x-axis is, uh, is the model complexity. Think of it as a number of parameters, but could be some other um, notion of complexity. And as you make the model more complicated, the training error, of course, uh, should reduce. That's what you would expect, because you are able to fit it better. The model can sort of wrap itself around the data a little bit better. But then the textbook says that the test error on unseen, the error on unseen data, you know, it improves up to a certain point, but then it starts rising as you overfit. And that's rising is called overfitting. That you're doing much better, you're doing, even though you're doing better on the training data, you're not doing so well on test data. And that the inflection point, at the inflection point, that the difference is called the generalization error. That's where, that's the correct model complexity that you should have. So I uh, described this overfitting by this example last time, that instead of a line, if you take a complicated curve, you can fit the training data much better, but it wouldn't predict well on unseen data. Now, that's a textbook picture, but in real life, actually, you, in, you <coughs> raise the model complexity, and you know, maybe the, the, the test error goes up slightly, maybe goes down slightly, you know, depending on the situation. But you, know, you never see this U-shaped phenomenon or at least not for quite a while. So somehow, deep learning, even with a much larger network, somehow does the sensible thing. So the uh, popular belief or conjecture is that when trained on reali realistic data, the net's parameters are constrained by data or training to be highly interdependent, okay, in low dimensional in some ways. 
I mean, there's no precise mathematical conjecture. This is just a vague uh, statement. So all these parameters are not really free. They are interdependent. So um, there was a very nice paper last year which uh, uh, focused a lot of attention on this overfitting issue or lack of overfitting uh, because they showed that actually even the stranded training algorithms, gradient descent, momentum, whatever, actually does not eliminate this excess capacity by itself. Because, uh, so the takeaway was that actually it's not just the training algorithm, but also properties of data. So I'll tell you the experiment. It's very cute. So you take standard data. So that's the line on the lower left. So how fast it gets. To, basically, on these uh, small data sets, you basically get zero training error. You basically fit the data because you're using a large model. So within 5,000 steps, you basically fit all the training data. And then you start corrupting the data. And there are various models of corruption. You can, let's say it's images. You can corrupt the pixels. You can even corrupt the labels. You can completely put random vectors and random labels there. So there's increasing models of corruption. And all of those, the model is able to fit. You know, it takes a little bit longer time, factor three or something, but it fits. So the model just wraps itself around random data. Um, so um, and, and the time to overfit is you know, not so large. Okay. Uh, I won't describe the, the right-hand figure. So that's the, that was the example. And so this shows that, you know, the standard training algorithm is still able to fit random data. So it is capable of overfitting. So somehow it has to do with the properties of data as well. Okay, so what uh, I'm going to describe is some paper of ours from uh, months ago where we uh, show that uh, we identify empirically that properly trained networks uh, on realistic data have a noise stability property and then we show rigorously that this noise stability property implies that the parameters lie in some lower dimensional subspace okay and we give some quantitative estimate, estimates so let me tell you what this noise stability experiment is so uh, Uh, sorry. So the noise injection experiment is that in this multi-layer network, imagine at some layer injecting Gaussian noise. So the layer was computing some vector, and now you add a Gaussian noise vector to that. How much, how much Gaussian noise? What norm? Very large. As much norm in the Gaussian vector as the vector that was being computed in that layer. So if x was a vector computed in that layer, you are actually adding a noise vector of the same norm. OK? So it's a lot of noise. And so the question is, how much, what's the percentage change shift in the higher layers? And uh, so here's the results for this VGG19. We did it for other uh, well-known architectures as well. So for VGG19 with 19 layers, um, so what this uh, plot shows is, you know, you injected that much noise at different layers. So blue was at, at, the, at the input layer, orange is at the next layer, et cetera. And you see that all of this noise gets rejected by the network. So a few layers up, like two or three layers up, basically it's been, it, it, the effect on that layer's output is very little. Okay, so this is what we call noise stability. Uh, by the way, ignore this uh, comment. It's from my ICM talk. Okay, so uh, so now, of course, noise stability was of great interest to the founders of computing, like von Neumann. They were building computers from uh, logic gates, uh, like uh, diodes and uh, like uh, vacuum tubes. So, so they were very interested in noise stable computation, and the key insight, and they were man they managed to do that, and the key insight was that the network has to be very redundant. That there is duplication built into the network and then it's, uh, because of that, it, uh, it can be stable to noise. So that was a key insight from that uh, early work. And what we'll see is that uh, there's noise stability also in this setting where 
uh, of deep nets, you'll see that it implies some kind of a redundancy. So for simplicity in this talk, I'm just talking about one layer, which is linear. Okay, so this, this whole notion of noise stability can be extended to the nonlinear case, but I'm describing the linear case. So a linear layer is just a matrix, so x gets mapped to m times x. So now if you inject noise at x, you get x plus eta, and so output is m of x plus eta. Now noise stability says that m of x plus eta is fairly close to m, to mx. So, um, so that's, uh, that's this property, right? So uh, the ratio of mx to x is much more than m eta to eta. Now the left-hand side is at most the top singular value of the matrix, okay, where uh, that, that ratio. Th these are all Euclidean norms. Um, and the right-hand side, well, Gaussian noise uh, distributes evenly in all directions. So it distributes evenly in all singular directions. And so if you do the calculation, it's some kind of an L2. This right-hand side is like uh, an estimate of the L2 norm of the singular values of the matrix. So there's noise stability saying that the largest singular value is much more than some L2 average. And so that suggests that there's some concentration of singular values. And indeed, when you compute the singular values of a layer, of this layer, then you see that uh, uh, this actually happens to be a square uh, matrix. And so it's eigenvalues. And there are a few large eigenvalues and then a ton of very small ones. Okay, so such matrices are compressible, not in the trivial way, because if you just uh, zero out those small singular values, that would not be a good compression, because they are small, but, not, but their L2 norm is large. So you can't do that kind of compression, but there are other kinds of compression you can do, okay, which we'll see next slide. So, so anyway, this ratio is roughly called the layer quotient, the ratio of these things. Okay? And so the proof sketch uh, again, I'm just using this linear case, but it works for nonlinear as well, is that under noise stability uh, property, the deep net can be made low dimensional. So the idea is that uh, you compress a layer via a randomized algorithm. And this randomized algorithm is, uh, is a linear compression where you take random matrices M1 through MK. These are signed matrices, plus one, minus one entries. And uh, it's important that they are picked before you see the data, okay? So ahead of time. And then you can write the layer matrix A as a linear combination of these sign matrices, random sign matrices, and the uh, coefficient in front is the inner product of the layer matrix and the sign matrix. Okay, think of them as vectors and that vector inner product. So it's a very simple linear compression scheme and it has the property I mean, this has been studied in, uh, in algorithms uh, uh, before, these kinds of uh, compressions. And it has a property that the, it uh, there's some uh, error produced, right? So this matrix, whatever it was computing, now this compressed matrix is, uh, has some error compared to that. And those errors are Gaussian-like. They behave like Gaussians if you look at their moments. So therefore, the network actually attenuates those errors. And so the output is not changing much. Okay, so that's the idea. So all that can be made uh, fairly rigorous, and k is logarithmic in original size, so the matrix becomes low dimensional. Now, uh, in real life deep nets, for those of you who know, I have this convolutional structure, and the proper uh, application of this idea is to those convolutional filters, not to the entire layer. Anyway, so that leads to a quantitative bound. I won't describe uh, all of these other notions, but when you try to do it for nonlinear uh, deep nets, you have to define noise stability in the appropriate way, and we got some estimates of the deep net uh, capacity, which were uh, orders of magnitude better than earlier attempts. And you can see that these uh, properties, like the layer cushion, which I defined, uh, they correlate with good generalization. So for instance, if you look, do those experiments with corrupted data and so on, the layer cushion is a lot worse with the corrupted data. Uh, and also, yeah, even during normal training with normal data, 
as the generalization improves, this layer question improves. So, uh, yeah, it correlates with generalization. So, concluding thoughts on generalization. There's uh, some progress, but the final story is still to be written, I think. Uh, our estimates are better than past estimates, but still very bad. They don't explain why, uh, you know, 20 million parameters uh, don't overfit with 50,000 examples, so it's still not strong enough. And uh, a, a trend lately, which I alluded to earlier, is that uh, there's something going on with gradient descent. It's finding very nice solutions, and there are just papers coming out this year which are trying to quantify that, the implicit bias of gradient descent. It's not just any old algorithm. It's a very special algorithm, and it's finding uh, low capacity models in some simple settings. Okay, so next part, optimization. Yeah. In the compression result, is it just a width compression in, in the width of the network? So it's no. Those matrices, MIs, uh, have the same width. So it's replacing, a, it's a replacing a, in that simple example, a, a, a fully connected layer, so which is a full matrix with a low rank matrix. I see. Uh, so it's a compression in the number of parameters. No, no, this was not about depth, yeah. This was just about, yeah, I was fitting those two in here, yeah. The depth part I was done with, sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, optimization. And uh, this is the bread and butter of uh, machine learning. And, uh, um, and yeah, the hurdle is that most problems are non-convex and in, in, on worst case instance are NP-hard. So why does it all work? So uh, I'll just give you a taste of you know, the kinds of things we are doing. I, I won't have time to give you actual theorems. Uh, not just we, but like we, the community. Um, and um, the basic uh, concepts, OK, so if gradient is non-zero, then there's a descent direction. And so where's your algorithm headed? What, what's your theorem going to say? You know, what is it finding? So there is, uh, the possible goals are it's finding a critical point where the gradient becomes zero. So it keeps making progress so long as the gradient is non-zero, and then it reaches a point where the gradient is zero. So you're finding critical points. Uh, or a better solution concept would be not just where a gradient is zero, but actually which is a point where this happens with the sort of local value around it. So nearby points are, are higher, have higher loss. Uh, so you could want that, or you could find the global optimum. Okay, now as I said, global optimum is very, difficult to find for non-convex problems. But local optima you can hope to find. What about assumption about initialization? Um, you're, if, you're, if you're going to try, try to prove a theorem that this process converges to some nice solution, uh, you have to make an assumption about initialization because the process started off somewhere. So are you going to prove convergence from all starting points for a random starting point, special starting points? So all of those have to be part of the, the theorem, and people are proving results like this. Uh, and then another distinction is black box versus non-black box, which I'll talk about next. And uh, the final thing is about running time. Okay, so if the size is D, so you're working in, the, let's say, D dimension, so the, there are D parameters in the network, so uh, then you want running time that's polynomial in D and one over epsilon, where epsilon is the desired accuracy. and you don't want exponential in D, because D could be 10,000, 1 million, and exponential of even 100 is too big. Forget million, exponential million. And um, why, this, uh, why do I warn about exponential running time? Because uh, there's a curse of dimensionality that in D dimensions, there are really exponential in D over epsilon directions, which are far away from each other. So, this was a surprising fact to me when I first learned about it many years ago, that in D dimensions, that exponential in D directions, whose pairwise angle is, uh, is 60 degrees. Okay, so I've drawn this sea urchin figure, right, spiny figure. In three dimensions, the sea urchin needs to have many spines. That means the spines are packed very close together. But if you had a D-dimensional urchin, a D urchin, then you would, it would be able to have lots of spines and they wouldn't be packed together. So what this also means is that, uh, and, and by the way, there are exponential in D directions, but they're not too many more. If you want uh, 
uh, to cover the space, you know, so that every uh, point in space is with an epsilon uh, of one of the directions, then you only need exponential of d over epsilon directions. So you can think of this exponential of d over epsilon as the time to explore d-dimensional space. Okay, if you want to walk around and check out all the points and what they're doing, you need exponential of d over epsilon time. And that's infeasible. So now this is relevant uh, if you try to prove theorems. So for instance, we have to do, uh, in many cases, black box analysis for deep learning, where we don't, we don't assume we know much about the function that we're trying to optimize. And the reason is, as I, uh, as I alluded to last time, that we don't really know the landscape because we don't really have a clean mathematical description of data. There's no ma uh, mathematical description of what makes a vector of pixels a picture of a dog. Right? And probably the only model we'll have for that will be some complicated deep net. So there's, so, uh, so for mathematics, as far as mathematics is concerned, you know, there's no uh, way to describe mathematically what that data is. And so if you treat the loss function as a, as a black box, and you just assume that you, all you have is the value, you input a theta and you get the value, or you input a theta and you get the gradient. So if you have that kind of a black box, clearly you cannot find the global optimum. You know, it's a simple argument that you know, the global optimum could be hidden in this one direction in the dimensional space. And if you just can do these kinds of queries uh, to this black box, then it'll take exponential of d over epsilon time to find this one special direction where the loss is being minimized. So you have to settle for weaker solution concepts. And uh, so the weaker solution concepts I already mentioned, like you know, new, uh, critical points, local minima, et cetera. So that's the way the analysis go in the black box uh, settings where, uh, so you argue that, okay, if the gradient is non-zero, then there's a descent direction. But that's not enough because you're making a finite movement. And so if the gradient is fluctuating a lot, you make a small movement along the negative gradient direction, and you may not reduce the loss. So, and that happens if the second derivative is high, the Hessian. So therefore, to ensure descent, you have to take small steps determined by the smoothness, and which you assume via some Gaussian smoothening. And then you can start proving these theorems, like you know, if the norm of the Hessian is at most beta, and the norm of the gradient is at most this much, then you need so many steps to, to, uh, to make the, to reduce the function value from this much to this much. Those kinds of uh, things can be done. Okay, so, um, okay, so you get, uh, you can reduce the norm of the gradient to some epsilon in some amount of time. So that's kind of like a, a relaxation of the critical point concept. You know, you, you may not actually get to a point with gradient zero, but you get to a point with small gradient. But that's a, actually a fairly weak solution concept. And the reason is that in high dimensions, you can have saddle points. So as the name suggests, it could be this uh, point where you are minimum in, uh, in one direction, in n minus one directions, but a maximum in one remaining direction. And so you want to find, when you're at such a point, most directions you know, won't, increase the, won't decrease the loss, they will increase the loss, but there's this one direction somewhere which will reduce the loss. So how do you find that? It's not completely clear at all. And uh, in the last few years, there have been analysis which show that if you add noise to the gradient at every step, so-called perturbed gradient descent, then actually you can evade these saddle points. Now, so wait, so now you may think, wait, what am I suggesting? That you should add noise to the gradient? Yes, people do that as well. But in practice, you don't need to add noise because there's enough sources of randomness in the data. So it's believed that the gradient, you anyway sort of estimating gradient by a small sample of data points. And so it's believed that you don't need to add any noise anyway. But anyway, once you add noise to the gradient, you think of adding noise to the gradient, you can prove a theorem, a rigorous theorem. And this theorem is proven by analyzing this walk. Now the walk is not a deterministic walk. You're not walking along the gradient, but it's a random walk, right? Because you're adding noise at every step. So it's a random walk. You can analyze this random walk. And you can show that in a reasonable amount of time, you escape all saddle points and arrive at an approximate second order minimum, some kind of a 
approximate local minima. Okay, and uh, yeah, so I won't uh, talk about more. Uh, and then for some simple models, actually, so this result is very nice, the approximate second order minimum, because for some simple models, not deep nets, but like uh, things that arise in applied mathematics, uh, it can be shown that these simple second order local minima are actually also global minima for those uh, simple cases. So this result had very nice application. Okay, so to conclude this part about uh, optimization, there's uh, this one strand, the full landscape argument, as in the previous slides. We assume global bounds on gradients, Hessians, et cetera, and then you can prove some results. And then, as I mentioned, for some simple settings, you can actually prove these bounds. So you have an end-to-end -end theorem that the algorithm is finding globally optimal solutions. There's a second strand of work, which is, uh, the, I think, the latest strand in which I'm most excited about, uh, which is trying to exploit the path that gradient descent takes. The gradient descent is a very special algorithm, and it follows a very special path. And you don't need to care about what, what's happening far away from this path, only what's happening in a little pipe around this path. Okay, the properties of the function in this little pipe. And that's a very special pipe. And those you can analyze using uh, simple ideas from PDs and no third theorems. I'm sure there's more complicated ideas out there which I'd love to know about, which we can apply. And uh, for example, if you do gradient descent on a linear net, so it's a product of matrices, uh, turns out that the net, uh, uh, so the net at every step in, along this gradient flow path has a property that these matrices, uh, their eigenspaces align. It's a very strong property, and gradient descent ensures that. Okay, so that's a, a new strand of work which I'm very excited about. There'll be some papers coming out of our group, and other people are working on these too. Okay, so uh, the last part will be theory of generator models and uh, generative adversarial nets. And uh, uh, okay, what are these images there? So the images on the left are generated by a deep net. So this deep net was shown pictures of many people, uh, actually celebrities, and, and then it learned to generate pictures of uh, people you've never seen before. Okay, although in this case you can see that the, they look kind of like celebrities you know. So it, it's not completely original images, but they are still images of new people who've never existed. So uh, how, does it, how does it all work? It's this uh, technique called generative adversarial nets, and I think Google marketing came up with a very nice phrase called dueling AIs, and that's the image in, from MIT's tech review about that. Dueling AIs, it's a very nice marketing image, a uh, marketing uh, phrase. Okay, so what is unsupervised learning? I described this last time when I talked about language models, which uh, try to understand the meaning of language. And the motivation for unsupervised learning is that you have some data, like image or language or something, and uh, it's in a complicated form, right? Lang images like in pixel form. That's very low level. And you want a more high level description. And the underlying motivation is that there's this manifold which describes the structure of data. So uh, manifold roughly in the sense of uh, geometry, although people don't really use any s special properties of differential geometry. But anyway, manifold meaning some low dimensional surface, that's the surface of high dimensional, uh, 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 high level representations. And then there's the images, and the image has a nearby point on the manifold, which is its code, the high level representation. So the goal is to use unlabeled data set to learn this image to code mapping. How do you know that this code is useful, you know? And well, so using the code, you should be able to reconstruct the image roughly. And uh, uh, so that's the way it's done, okay? That uh, you typical mo typically model it as a probability distribution, that there's a distribution on these codes. And the image is generated by taking a point on this manifold and producing a nearby point uh, in the image space. So it's done in this uh, statistical framework traditionally, uh, and the hope is that this code is a high-level representation that's a good substitute for this image or this object X in other classification tasks. So using just a large data set of unlabeled images, you learn a high-level representation of images, whatever that means, and the test for that 
the quality of that high level representation is that if you use it in downstream tasks, uh, it allows you to save on uh, uh, sample, or on labeled images. So you can do the task with very few labeled images. Okay, so in language uh, settings, uh, yeah, that you understand language, and so to train on a new task, you don't need as many labeled examples. So as I said, this is uh, done in this uh, classical statistical framework of generative models, and there were some problems with that. So, uh, so the idea is that uh, in generative models, in the way it was applied was that uh, the manifold is just some uniform sphere, so you're getting white noise from this uniform sphere, and it's passed, that vector is passed through a deep net, which you're going to train, and the output is a nice image, okay, at the pixel level that looks realistic. So that's the goal, okay? And so if you can do that, the, this Z, the input, is the code for the image, the high-level description. So uh, the usual training uh, from, for several years was the usual statistical idea of maximizing the log probability assigned to realistic images. So you see how much probability does it assign to some data set of 100,000 images, okay? The classic log likelihood framework. And uh, the, the, the reason for inventing something new was that these log likelihood type of training uh, methods would produce fuzzy images, okay? Because they're trying to make sure that they assign non-zero probability to everything because you're going to take logs. And so that means that they end up also assigning very high probability to these fuzzy images. They're not sharp. So the idea in GANS was that instead of doing this statistical procedure, you use the power of deep learning itself to generate, to help uh, gen, uh, improve the generator model. So there's a generator model, which is a deep net, and its output is this fuzzy thing. And you try to improve this deep net so that it doesn't output fuzzy things using another deep net. Okay, and this is the end-to-end -end differentiable model that I mentioned, that you have two deep nets and you can now train them together using the, the derivative. So that's the idea. Uh, so you have two deep nets, you're training two deep nets. There's a discriminator net, DB, and there's a generator net, G sub U. V, is, uh, v and U are the uh, parameters, the trainable parameters of these deep nets. And the discriminator is trained to output one on real images and zero on synthetic images. Okay, so this uh, discriminator net can be given real images or synthetic images, and on these it is told you should output one, on this you should output zero. So it's trained that way by backpropagation. The generator is trained with all opposite uh, objective that it tries to produce synthetic images that fool this discriminator. Make it output its synthetic images, but it makes it output one instead of zero. So that's the goal. And so if you write it down, uh, there are various ways to formalize those goals, but here's a simple one. That uh, the, object, the, uh, the loss function in question is the expected output of the discriminator net on synthetic images and the expected output on uh, real images. Okay, so real images is x from d real and h is the seed and g sub u of h is a synthetic image and the output of the discriminator net on the synthetic image, so the expectation of those. So those two expectations should be, uh, the, the, dif the difference of those two expectations is the loss quantity and, and the generator is trying to, uh, to minimize that, and the discriminator is trying to maximize that. Discriminator is trying to maximize, to discriminate between those two distributions, so it's trying to maximize that, and the generator is trying to minimize that. So it's a min-max game, which uh, is just like game theory. This, by the way, was the Stein GAN objective, what I just described. So it's really a game theory, right? Two-person game. One is trying to minimize this, one is trying to maximize that. Uh, and the generator wins if the objective is zero and further training of discriminator doesn't help. Okay, so that's called an equilibrium in this game. So this became very popular uh, two, three years ago and uh, many theorists that I know, you know, love this model. You know, it presses all the right buttons. It has these, uh, some notions of pseudorandomness, discriminating two distributions. Uh, there's game theory, you know, so it just presses all the right buttons. So we did a first cut analysis of this and uh, let me tell you what we found. So, uh, so this was a new insight from theory. So, so what spoils against trainers' days? So this was, uh, I mean, this has been a worry from day one. Uh, 
something called mode collapse, that the discriminator is learning from a few samples, say 100,000 images, but the number of potential images is gazillions. So does it learn to produce genuinely new images, right? Um, and so the fear was that it sort of doesn't produce, it learn distributions, learn to produce distributions, which are very diverse. Okay, so you learn from celebrities, and the images you produce kind of look like celebrities. They don't look like you and me, or at least like me. So, um, so, um, so there were many ad hoc qualitative tests for mode collapse that people had come up with, and somehow the issue wasn't really clear. Like, uh, can you avoid mode collapse and so on? And the new insight from our theory paper was that a couple of years ago was that uh, the mode collapse problem does not have to do with training samples. You can train with as many samples as you like. It has to do with the size or capacity of the discriminator. Okay, so now capacity, as I said, is a complicated thing to formalize, but assume it's the number of parameters for now. So the theorem that we had was that if the discriminator size is n, then there is a generator, always, a very simple generator that generates a distribution supported on n log n images, and which, which still wins against all possible discriminators. And tweaking the objectives or increasing the training sample doesn't help. So this is like, always this equilibrium. And uh, so what that shows is that at least the framework of GANs, the way it's formulated, is not able or not guaranteed to always avoid mode collapse. Because clearly the real distribution probably has infinite or very large support, gazillions. And so it implies that there are these bad equilibria always, which a small discriminator is not capable of uh, detecting. So, you know, even if the discriminator has, you know, 20 million parameters, 20 million times log n is still not gazillion. So, uh, yeah, so that's the uh, result. And the uh, proof sketch is that, you know, it's an epsilon at argument that once a generator learns to produce n log n random real images, that's enough to fool the, the discriminator. And there's a simple epsilon at argument, which I won't try to describe. Okay, so the theory suggests that GANs training is not uh, guaranteed to avoid mode collapse. And the question my uh, colleagues asked was, okay, does this happen in real life training? Mode collapse. And because uh, they had these nice GANs, which they thought were working pretty well. So the question I was thinking was, how do you check the support side of the generator's distribution? And I'll tell you in uh, a couple of slides what we did. So we came with this Berthier paradox test, uh, which is this uh, paradox from discrete math that if you have 23 random people in the room, then the chance is at least a half that two of them share a birthday. And the reason it's a paradox is that uh, freshmen think that it sh this number should be 365, 366, right? But actually, it's 23, square root of 366. So, um, and the general uh, statement is that if a distribution is supported on n in images, then the probability that a sample of size square root n has a duplicate image is at least a half. Okay, so now if your distribution is not very diverse and it only has a million images, you should be able to take a sample of size 1,000 and detect duplicates or near duplicates. So that's exactly what we did. And so that's the birthday paradox test with uh, Andrew Ryszewski, who's uh, one of the co-authors who's here, postdoc at MIT. And um, so that's the implementation. You did that. And we indeed found that well-known GANs actually do not have a very large support size. Okay, so you, you, in fairly small samples, you find duplicates or near duplicates. So these are some of the duplicates we found. Okay, so I'll wrap up. I'm out of time. Uh, what to work on? These are suggestions for theorists who, or mathematicians who are interested in looking at deep learning. Uh, here are some of the things I think are, uh, are developing nicely and are worth looking at. So uh, I think there are a lot of insights from physics and PDEs, like these evolution of these gradient paths, which I think are very interesting and uh, should be looked at. Uh, unsupervised learning, uh, I think, is really cool. I've always liked it. Um, and here's a quote from Jan Lecun, the director of uh, Facebook research, that uh, the revolution will not be supervised, not televised, and not supervised. Um, theory for deep reinforcement learning, I didn't talk about that at all. Uh, I talked about it a little bit last time. Uh, you know, Go playing programs, they use deep nets, and there's very little theory for that. Um, and going beyond three, design interesting models for interactive learning. This is, I think, a very nice area, that machines of future will be, will be sort of situated agents which interact with people 
And there's really not very interesting models. There are these models for static learning, as I said, you know, data comes from a fixed distribution. But this interactive learning seems uh, like a wide open uh, area for theory and for uh, empirical work, actually. So concluding thoughts, uh, deep learning is a new frontier for theory with many new avenues. Uh, I think the best theory will emerge from engaging with real data and uh, real deep net training. I mean, it's, this software is downloadable. Undergrads download it or high schoolers and play with it. It's, uh, it's uh, fun. And uh, I think one has to look at those experimental results and uh, experimental phenomena to start developing interesting theory. And uh, finally, I'm optimistic that deep learning methods can be understood and simplified. And it's a great mathematical problem. Uh, and we're reminded of Hilbert's, I mean, it looks like a big mystery right now, but Hil as Hilbert said, in mathematics, there is no ignorambimus. Thank you very much. <laughs> and as usual, if you didn't see this uh, advertisement for next year, so there's a special year at the IAS next year, which I'm running, which students and postdocs and faculty can come to. Uh, and some resources. I'll take questions now. Yeah. So, uh, one that uh, is just for my panel now gives me more insight. I use an example. You have uh, both the YouTube yeah, yeah. and uh, Osteo NerdNet. Yeah. And uh, obviously, you have different things. Yeah. Than, yeah. Than you must have heard yeah. Of. No, th those are very cool models. So, the question was why does statistical mechanics not play a bigger role? Uh, and the usual thing people have in mind there is something like an easing model. And uh, I mean, it, it, theoretically, you could have easing models representing multi-layer nets, right, depending on which. Uh, but there's no theory, I'm told, for those, the multi-layer easing models. So, uh, so there's something called uh, RBMs, uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, which are multi-layer. But there's no theory for it. And even the definition actually is there's a big hole in it, <laughs> so. I'm just wondering, so that non-convection, is it coming out of spin glass? I, I wouldn't agree that it's coming out of, yeah. Spin glass theory also sees non-convexity, yeah. There's all kinds of other non-convex phenomena. Like I showed you, even regression, you can have non-convex. Other questions? It cannot be, no. The theorem says that that lacuna that we showed, so this was about the GANs, you know, the low support size, it cannot be fixed with additional training. Well, it's, it's okay, but any practical discriminator is, is not going to be that big. Right. So n log n, where n is the discriminator size, or discriminator capacity. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I recently come across a Julia Pearl. Pearl. Understatement, he's a Turing Award winner for that. Yeah, exactly. okay. And the uh, point is that he wants to separate correlation and causation. Yeah. And that if I remember what you said in your last talk, when we find a correlation that's going on in our brain, yeah. with what's yeah. happening in the neural network. Yeah. So you were talking about spin glass probe yeah. uh, as essentially looking for correlation but also causation. People are very interested in that. Yeah, so the question was uh, the correlation causation. So machine learning is largely speaking about correlation. Uh, and causation is a very difficult philosophical question. Uh, and I think people are very interested in that. Um, yeah, uh, but not, it hasn't really played. People are trying things, but nothing has really played a role. So yeah, people are very aware of that. Yeah. Of deep learning? Yeah. Of deep learning. Yeah, the question was practical applications of deep learning. Uh, um, everything. I mean, so basically just <laughs> any place where there's data and you want decision making, people are applying deep learning to it. Um, in, in some settings that I know of, yeah, deep learning doesn't provide a big 
advantage over simpler methods, but in others it does. Oh, self-driving cars, definitely, yeah, many people are using deep nets, yeah. Among other things, yeah. So actually what enables, uh, like why people got serious about self-driving cars is because the, um, the vision has improved so much because of deep nets. So for sure, the vision engine is there, like uh, labeling objects and so on. So that's definitely deep nets, the state of the art deep nets. And then even the decision making, people are trying to do with deep learning, like I described last time. Uh, any other questions? Any questions? All right, so let's thanks Professor Arola again. Thank you.